Welcome everyone to another lecture in my series on the approach to common cardiac conditions. The topic for today is atrial fibrillation, which is one of the most common arrhythmias you'll encounter as a physician. My objectives for this lecture will be first for you to understand the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation, to understand some of the risk factors for a patient going into atrial fibrillation, to understand the classification of atrial fibrillation, to properly diagnose atrial fibrillation and order appropriate testing, and to order the appropriate management for your patient in atrial fibrillation, which will include uh, anticoagulation for stroke prevention, uh, rate control medications, rhythm control strategies, and invasive therapies for advanced atrial fibrillation. Here is an image from a telemetry monitor from an ICU patient who's currently in atrial fibrillation. You can see on the green lines that the patient is in a regular, uh, in irregular narrow complex rhythm uh, without clear consistent atrial activity. And this is typical for atrial fibrillation. In addition, this patient also has an arterial line placed, which you can see here, and this displays the blood pressure recordings through an invasive monitor. And you can appreciate that the amplitude of the pulse waves, um, which corresponds to the pulse pressure of the patient, is variable from beat to beat. And this is typical because of the variability in the diastolic filling time in the heart, the um, heart sometimes doesn't fill completely, and as a result, the pulse pressure, the stroke volume, will be variable, and that will lead to a, a dramatic variability in the pulse pressure. The point here being that atrial fibrillation leads to a very inefficient uh, method of heart contraction, and that will contribute to the symptomatology and management of atrial fibrillation. Now, traditionally, we think of atrial fibrillation as arising from unusually excitable tissue inside the left atrium, in particular, near the pulmonary veins. Uh, these triggers can include a focal source of atrial fibrillation, usually coming from right around the junction between the pulmonary vein tissue and the left atrial tissue. Reentrant pathways around scar tissue within the atrium itself and something called a rotor, which uh, sends signals in different directions throughout the atrium at different rates and uh, causes irregularities in the rhythm. Here's a series of diagrams showing the atria. Here you see the right atrium with the IVC, inferior vena cava, and the superior vena cava, SVC, coming in. And on this side, you see the left atrium with the four pulmonary veins coming into it. You'll notice a little structure here labeled LAA. This is the left atrial appendage. It's a little pocket that's sticking outside of the left atrium. And this will become very important later when we discuss stroke prevention as this little pocket here can be a source of clots uh, forming and embolizing to the brain. See this tissue here where the star is um, marks the location where the pulmonary vein tissue, uh, the vascular endothelial tissue transitions into the myocardial tissue of the left atrium. And whenever there's a transition in the type of tissue that's occurring, um, in this case from an electrically inert tissue to an electrically excitable tissue, this can become very irritable and excitable and send out uh, random signals which would lead to atrial fibrillation. The other diagrams here show alternative mechanisms for atrial fibrillation, including re-entrant pathways, which is where electricity flows around in a loop continuously. The rotors where electrical activity is um, going in different directions at different times throughout the atrium. And the effect of scar tissue in the left atrium, uh, which is indicated by these red lines, um, that can be caused by ischemia or stretch of the left atrium due to high left atrial pressures, 
and the presence of extensive scarring will lead to electrical activity being uh, flowing chaotically around the atrium and leading to irregular rhythms. So this explains on an anatomical level why patients develop atrial fibrillation. But as clinicians, we really want to know why the patient is in atrial fibrillation. What are the underlying risk factors that are that have precipitated the atrial fibrillation and what can I do about them? So some of the risk factors would include cardiac causes such as ischemic heart disease, which would cause scarring in the left atrium, uh, mitral valve disease, which would increase left atrial pressures uh, and lead to stretch and um, create foci for atrial fibrillation, a congenital defect or channelopathy, which would lead to highly excitable foci in the atrium, and heart failure, which is one of the most common uh, risk factors for atrial fibrillation. This is a vicious cycle because the heart failure itself is causing elevated left atrial pressures, which is stretching out the atrium and contributing to the atrial fibrillation. But on the other hand, the atrial fibrillation itself can cause something called tachycardio-induced cardiomyopathy, induced ventricular remodeling, and worsen the heart failure itself. So these two processes, atrial fibrillation and heart failure, tend to go hand in hand. Drug-related causes include um, alcohol, and stimulants such as cocaine and amphetamines, as well as caffeine, which is a very common uh, marker, uh, more very common risk factor in young patients who drink a lot of caffeine, uh, coffee or tea. Pulmonary causes include uh, COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, pulmonary emboli, and ARDS, which is often seen in ICU patients who present with uh, atrial fibrillation with a rapid heart rate. In this case, uh, the pulmonary causes are increasing right atrial pressures, stretching out the right atrium, and often the foci of the atrial fibrillation are in the right atrium. Endocrine causes include hyperthyroidism and pheochromocytoma, both of which would increase the sympathetic response in the body and contribute to arrhythmias in the heart. Iatrogenic causes, which we should all watch out for as physicians, would include a complication of a cardiac catheterization or surgery due to a nicking of the atrial walls, a central line placement. So if the uh, central line is placed too deep into the right atrium and hitting the walls, can also trigger a fo focus of atrial fibrillation. Medication-induced um, atrial fibrillation which would include uh, use of steroids and pressors. Very commonly in the medical wards, we see patients who are on uh, very frequent doses of beta agonists, such as albuterol, and these would also be likely to send the patient into atrial fibrillation. We generally classify atrial fibrillation on the basis of the timing of the uh, fibrillation patterns and the uh, rate heart rate that the patient has during the episode. So there's new onset or newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. This is a tricky category since uh, a patient may present with atrial fibrillation with no previous known history of atrial fibrillation, but that doesn't exclude the possibility that the patient had uh, previous episodes of atrial fibrillation that were undiagnosed at home. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is when the atrial fibrillation returns to sinus rhythm either with or without medical therapy within one week, but can uh, also recur. Persistent atrial fibrillation is when a single atrial fibrillation episode is continuing for longer than a week. And permanent atrial fibrillation is a label given when a physician has made the decision not to attempt to cardiovert the patient or ablate the patient to return them back to sinus rhythm. Valvular atrial fibrillation specifically refers to atrial fibrillation that's uh, due to mitral stenosis or a mitral valve replacement repair, specifically in the context of a mechanical uh, mitral valve replacement. This can be confusing because some people misinterpret valvular AFib to include conditions such as mitral regurgitation, but in technically those mitral regurgitation does not classify a person for having valvular AFib. Then there are the 
heart rate based classifications, which would be atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or RVR, slow ventricular response or SVR, or a normal ventricular response. When clinically assessing our patients with atrial fibrillation, it's very important, as always, to take a very thorough history and physical to look for possible causes, including the risk factors we discussed before, to determine the kind of symptoms the patient might be having when they go into the atrial fibrillation episodes, which could include palpitations or syncopal episodes, and to evaluate the timing so that you can classify them as either paroxysmal, persistent, or permanent. Of course, we'll be obtaining an ECG uh, on the patient to confirm the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, look for evidence of an accessory pathway or WPW, look for evidence of ischemic changes, which could be contributing, and to establish the baseline intervals. Normally, we also obtain a transthoracic echocardiogram to look for at the valves to assess for valvular causes of atrial fibrillation, look for left atrial enlargement or increase in atrial pressures. We usually place them on a cardiac telemonitor to look for the timing of the atrial fibrillation, assess whether when they return back to sinus rhythm, uh, whether their heart rate has now become bradycardic. And this is part of the tachybrady syndrome, which uh, requires more careful management and to look for other possible arrhythmias that might be coexisting with atrial fibrillation. It's very important to order uh, thyroid function testing in all patients with atrial fibrillation as a uh, new onset of atrial fibrillation may be one of the earliest um, and only presenting signs of hyperthyroidism in certain patients, especially the elderly. And to evaluate for some of the possible pulmonary risk factors for atrial fibrillation, we would obtain chest x-ray, outpatient PFTs, and sleep studies to assess for um, lung disease and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, diagnosing atrial fibrillation using an ECG can be a really tricky thing to do sometimes. So here's an example. A patient... This patient has a, actually a normal heart rate. Uh, if you count the QRS complexes, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So 13 times six is 78 would be the approximate heart rate here. I had to use that method for calculating the heart rate because as you can see, the uh, RR intervals are very irregular. Here's a short RR interval. Here's a longer one. Uh, here's another short one, longer one. Um, so there's really no clear pattern to the R, uh, RR intervals. In addition, if you look at the atrial activity, uh, it's not very consistent. You see little bumps and blips uh, across the baseline, which you might mistake for some atrial activity or P waves, but it's just not consistent enough to be called a clear P wave. And so whenever you see a narrow, complex, irregular, irregular rhythm without clear, distinct, and consistent P wave morphologies, uh, you can call that atrial fibrillation. So that patient's heart rate was fairly well controlled. Here's an example where it's not so well controlled. Again, it's a narrow complex, irregular, irregular rhythm, but much, much faster than the previous one. If you count the number of QRS complexes across the strip here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. So that gives us a heart rate of about 174 beats per minute. Again, there's no clear distinct atrial activity going on in between the T wave and the P wave and the QRS complexes. So we'll call this atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or atrial fibrillation with RVR.
but not all irregularly irregular rhythms with narrow complex QRSs are atrial fibrillation. Here's an example of another narrow complex irregularly irregular rhythm. And this time we have a heart rate of around 84 beats per minute. And if we look at the atrial activity here, we see that there is actually consistent atrial activity. We see almost a sinusoidal pattern that's consistently repeating itself in between the QRS complexes. And that's characteristic of atrial flutter. Now, normally atrial flutter is a pretty regular rhythm, but when there's variable AV block, uh, some of these flutter waves don't get conducted as quickly as others, and that leads to regularities in the rhythm. So this is atrial flutter with variable AV block. It's not always easy to distinguish between of atrial fibrillation and flutter. As you can see in this example here, uh, we see, if you look in V1, you'll see that at times you see clear distinct atrial activity, uh, which might appear like flutter waves. See it getting repeated again and again. But again, it's not particularly consistent. So you see nice clear waves here, but they kind of fizzle out over here and not very consistent over here either or here. So whenever you see flutter waves that, or what seem to be like flutter waves that come and go that don't seem particularly consistent, this is more consistent with uh, coarse atrial fibrillation. As opposed to flutter. The coarse waves that might be mistaken for flutter waves are F waves with a lowercase f. Uh, when they have an amplitude greater than 0.5 millimeters, uh, you can call that coarse atrial fibrillation when they're too fast or too inconsistent to be flutter waves. Remember that flutter waves would tend to occur around every uh, one big box apart or 300 times a minute. And some of these waves are well faster than that. This is maybe only about half a big box apart between each, uh, each F wave. If you look at the 13th beat in this rhythm, you see that it looks a lot different than the others. It has a different axis and different morphology. If you look in V1 and V2, you'll see it has an R, S, R prime pattern um, with a rather wide, wider QRS complex than the surrounding QRS complexes. Uh, this is typical of a right bundle branch block pattern. And if you're wondering why the patient all of a sudden in a single beat developed a right bundle branch block, you can look at the R to R interval in the preceding two QRS complexes. See that it was a rather wide uh, R to R interval. And then the beat with the right bundle branch block pattern occurred really quickly after the second QRS complex. And what happened there was that because the preceding R to R interval was very long, the right bundle was taking also much longer to repolarize completely and reset itself. So that when the uh, next fibrillation conducted beat here came, uh, the right bundle wasn't fully repolarized and was in a refractory state. So the uh, beat was blocked in the right bundle, which created this right bundle branch block pattern just for this beat which reset itself by the time the next beat came. So whenever you see a beat coming very quickly after a series of beats with a long R to R interval, um, and that beat happened to have a right bundle, unusual morphology, um, that's referred to as the Ashman phenomenon. Here's one more example of an narrow complex, irregularly regular tachycardia, which can often be confused for atrial fibrillation. In this case, we are helpfully provided with a series of arrows, which point us to atrial activity. We see a P wave here, a taller P wave here, and a shorter P wave here, an inverted P wave here, and a sort of biphasic P wave here. So when we see multiple P wave morphologies that are alternating between each other and 
there's at least uh, three of them, three different p-wave morphologies in a given ECG, we can call that multifocal atrial tachycardia. When it comes to the management of atrial fibrillation, one of the most key uh, points about the management would be prevention of a stroke because uh, fibrillation and inconsistent contraction of the atrium leads to venous stasis, which as part of uh, one of the Virchow's triad can lead to increased uh, coagulability and formation of clots, which can then embolize to the brain and cause a stroke. One of the most common clinical tools we use to assess a patient's stroke risk in atrial fibrillation is called the chads vas score, and it measures the annual risk of score, uh, which is a cumulative effect from 2% stroke risk with a patient with a score of 2 up to 15% annually with a patient that has a score of 9. The components of the chad vas score are a history of CHF, which gets one point, history of hypertension, which gets another point, age, uh, one point given for an age between 65 and 74, two points for age greater than 75, uh, history of diabetes, uh, sex, which uh, would get one point if the patient is female, stroke or TIA, which gets another point, any history of vascular disease, which would get another point. And you would total all of these points up and anticoagulation would be advised for any patient with a score greater than one um, in the absence of life-threatening bleeding. Certain types of patients are just automatically at higher risk for stroke and uh, clotting Regardless of their chad vas score, these would include patients with hyperthyroid-induced atrial fibrillation, as the hyperthyroidism itself can contribute to a hypercoagulable state. So for patients with a chad vas score 0 to 1, with no other reasons to um, anticoagulate, can be managed only with aspirin. But for all other patients, we need to think about what anticoagulation to put on the, on the patient. So here's a table containing some of the medications we can use. Uh, the earliest and one of the most widely studied of our anticoagulation options is the vitamin K antagonist warfarin. Um, as you can see here, uh, this was studied very early on, 1991. The SPAF trial showed that it was useful in preventing stroke and atrial fibrillation. We dose it based on the patient's INR, which would... Uh, of course, require regular blood draws to measure the INR and adjust dosing. Of many factors, including the patient's diet, uh, can influence the patient's therapeutic INR levels. So this drug might need to be adjusted very frequently. We usually choose a target of an INR of two to three for most patients, but would set higher targets uh, such as 2.5 to 3.5 in patients with valvular heart disease uh, causing atrial fibrillation. It's easily reversed with a combination of vitamin K and a prothrombin com complex constant, or PCC. In the 21st century, we started to see a rise in the use of uh, oral anticoagula anticoagulants, or OAX. Um, this, one of the earliest was rivaroxaban, marketed under the brand name Zarelto. This is a direct factor 10A inhibitor. It was uh, studied first during the ROCKET AF trial published in 2011. And the dosing is 20 milligrams daily or uh, 15 milligrams adjusted for lower uh, renal function. And it can be reversed with a recently developed agent called endexinet alpha. A competitor to rivaroxaban is apixaban, branded under the name Eliquis. This is another factor 10 inhibitor it was studied uh, in the Aristotle and Aristophanes trial where it was shown to be equally effective or if not more effective than warfarin at preventing stroke and minimizing bleeding risk. It's dosed BID, um, five milligrams as the standard dose, which can be half to 2.5 milligrams BID if the patient meets two out of the three um, criteria, which would be creatinine greater than 1.5 weight less than 60 kilograms or age greater than 80. It has the same reversal agent and dexinet alpha as rivaroxaban.
Dabigatran, marketed under the brand name Pradaxa, is a direct thrombin inhibitor, unlike the other uh, previous two OACs, which are factor 10A inhibitors. It was studied during the RELY trial, uh, published in 2009. It has different suggested doses. It's also dosed BID, like apixaban. Uh, 150 milligrams BID is the high dose, which was in the RELY trial was suggested to be more effective at reducing stroke with equal bleeding risk as warfarin. Um, the 110 milligram dose, which was equally effective at warfarin at preventing stroke with lower bleeding risk, and the 70 milligrams BID renally dosed um, option. It has a different agent, uh, a little older agent called itericizumab. An agent that's uh, less commonly seen is edoxaban, marketed under the brand name Cevesa. This is another factor 10 inhibitor. Um, it's also daily dosed, um, but not recommended in patients with significant renal impairment. It uses the same uh, reversal agent, indexinate alpha, as the other factor 10 inhibitors. Two important points to keep in mind with anticoagulation is that uh, warfarin, which would be bridged to therapeutic doses with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, is the only option for patients who either have mechanical heart valves or moderate to severe mitral stenosis. In other words, those patients with valvular aphid. Pregnant women who need anticoagulation for their atrial fibrillation, you should choose low molecular weight heparin during the first trimester and also in the period of two to four weeks before delivery. At all other times, second and third trimester, you can use um, warfarin. Now, a common question that arises in inpatient medical wards are, what about patients who are undergoing or plan for surgery and need to be on anticoagulation for their atrial fibrillation? How do I manage that? So for those patients, uh, you, you'll stop their warfarin five days prior to the surgery. The DOACs that they're on, um, whether adoxaban, rivaroxaban, or apixaban, or um, dibigatran, You'll hold them usually one to two days prior if they have normal renal function. Otherwise, hold three to four days prior. And low molecular weight heparins used therapeutically, uh, you would hold 24 hours prior. Uh, that's different from low molecular weight heparin given for DVT prophylaxis, which can be held 12 hours prior. And hold any unfractionated heparin or heparin drips of four to six hours prior to surgery. Now, for a long time, physicians were scared to hold warfarin for such a long time prior to patient surgery. There's a big concern that the patient might develop a stroke in that five-day window if they didn't start any other anticoagulation to keep them protected during that time. And so there was a tradition of bridging patients um, preoperatively with uh, low molecular weight heparin or heparin drips. And more recently... Uh, people started to wonder whether that was necessary, whether you could just hold the warfarin and just let them sit without any anticoagulation for those five days, whether that would significantly increase their risk of stroke. So that was studied in the BRIDGE trial uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. And it showed that most patients who had warfarin interrupted for surgery, uh, whether or not they used bridging therapy with uh, heparin, didn't increase uh, their stroke risk. So after that, the use of preoperative bridging started to fall off. And nowadays, we tend to reserve bridging for patients who have high stroke risk, so CHADVAS scores greater than four, any mechanical valves, rheumatic heart disease, or those patients who've had a recent stroke within the past three months. So you bridge patients in any of these four categories, but for all other patients, you can... Um, just stop their anticoagulation and let them sit without anticoagulation till their surgery occurs. Another common question that arises is what about patients who need to be not only on anticoagulation, but also antiplatelet therapy, especially after they've had a stent placed for an MI? There were a few trials that studied uh, this and helped us to shape our current guidelines on, the, on this question. First was the WOAS trial published in the Lancet Journal in 2013. 
that looked at patients who had PCI with a drug eluting stent placed and also history of atrial fibrillation. And they compared the use of just clopidogrel and an oral anticoagulant rather than the full triple therapy of aspirin, clopidogrel, and an oral anticoagulant. And they found that the two drug regimen had a lower risk of bleeding complications and without in higher increased risk in restenosis, which was a surprising result. And not everyone accepted it very quickly. So there was still a significant use of triple therapy for an extended period of time. Then the ISAR SAVE trial, which didn't look just look at atrial fibrillation patients, but all patients who had a drug eluting stent placed, the traditional teaching was that you would continue dual antiplatelet therapy for one year after a stent was placed. But they compared the use of just doing it for six months to using it for the full 12 months, one year. And they found that the six month uh, therapy was non-inferior. Finally, the ISAR triple trial published in the New England Journal in 2017, again, looked at atrial fibrillation patients who had a drug eluting stent placed, and they compared the use of triple therapy, aspirin, clopidogrel, and an anticoagulant for only six weeks compared to the six months that was now being used after the results of the ISAR SAFE trial came out. And they found that the triple therapy for six weeks, followed by dual antiplatelet therapy for the remainder of the uh, one year after the stent was placed, was no worse than the six-month approach. And as a result of these three trials, the newest recommendations are that patients who require to antiplate the therapy after a stent placed, you'd continue them in most patients for one to three months, the full triple therapy, aspirin, clopidogrel, and an oral anticoagulant, and even in patients with really high ischemic risk, high risk of uh, restenosis of their stent, you shouldn't continue the triple therapy for more than six months to minimize the risk of bleeding. From the six to 12 month window, if you stopped it after one month, you, that would be the two to 12 month window. Um, you would just use dual antiplatelet therapy, clopidogrel, and an oral anticoagulant. A uh, low dose of Viroxaban of 15 milligrams daily rather than the full 20 milligrams daily is a good choice for the oral anticoagulant. And we would generally discontinue all antiplatelet therapy after 12 months and just leave them on the anticoagulant. Always try to keep your patients with uh, multiple anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy on a PPI to minimize the risk of bleeding. Here's a transesophageal echo showing the left atrium up here. Over here marked is the left atrial appendage, which is that little pocket jutting out of the left atrium. Uh, and this is where the clots tend to form. You can't see a clear thrombus in the left atrium, but what you do see is this grayish smoke that's spreading all the, all the way throughout the left atrium. And this uh, smoke, the technical term is spontaneous echo contrast, uh, that's indicative that there is a left atrial appendage thrombus there, even though you can't clearly see it. So that smoke is the little particles of thrombus that are showering throughout the left atrium. So now a big question arises is, what do you do about patients who you feel do have high stroke risk, but you don't want to keep them on anticoagulation for extended period of time, uh, especially for their entire lifetime, because of your concern for bleeding risk? There is an option for those patients as well. So since most of the clots that form in uh, and shower and cause strokes tend to come from the left atrial appendage, one option would be to somehow block off the left atrial appendage, seal it off, and that in itself might decrease the risk of stroke considerably, even if you don't put them on anticoagulation. Now, there is a device that was specially designed for doing exactly that. Uh, that's the left atrial appendage occlusion device. Uh, one of the brand names marketed under is the Watchman device. Uh, how that works is a catheter will be placed. Uh, there'll be a transeptal puncture from the right atrium to the left atrium. The catheter will be directed into the left atrial appendage uh, 
and then a device will be inflated at the opening of the left atrial appendage, which over time will fibrose and occlude this area, blocking off the left atrial appendage. And when the blood flow stops flowing in the appendage, that'll also um, block itself off and um, possibly decrease the risk of stroke in these patients. This was specifically studied in the PROTECT atrial fibrillation trial published in Lancet in 2009, and it showed that this approach was not inferior to long-term warfarin therapy, which is a great result for patients who, uh, for whatever reason, can't be continued on long-term anticoagulation. Now, it's still important to remember that this isn't a complete alternative to anticoagulation. So patients who absolutely cannot be anticoagulated at all uh, cannot be candidates for this procedure because any patient who has this placed needs to continue anticoagulation for 45 days after the implant and then after that continue on dual antiplatelet for six months. Now all that is great for preventing the patient's stroke risk but anticoagulation doesn't address the underlying rhythm. So there's two approaches for addressing the rhythm um, for the atrial fibrillation itself and its effect on the heart. And historically, these have been the rate control strategy and the rhythm control strategy. Back in 2002, the AFFIRM study was published in the New England Journal, and they compared a rate control approach with AV blocking medications uh, compared and anticoagulation compared to a rhythm control approach where they would give the patients antiarrhythmic medications to try and suppress their atrial fibrillation. And they found that there was really no mortality benefit in choosing the rate control strategy versus the rhythm control strategy, but that the rhythm control drugs that they gave the patients did increase the risk of developing serious side effects. And so as a result of that study, um, in most patients, we've always chosen the rate control option plus anticoagulation as the preferred method for dealing with atrial fibrillation. However, there are two situations where you would want to prefer a rhythm control approach. That would be patients who are symptomatic and having lifestyle limiting symptoms such as syncope and palpitations. The other are patients with heart failure where the synchronous atrioventricular contraction helps to keep the cardiac output. Uh, think back to the a picture on the telemonitor from the beginning of this lecture where the cardiac output was very variable in the, patients, in the patient with atrial fibrillation. And also the fact that you know, long-term atrial fibrillation causes cardiac remodeling and impairs uh, myocardial function. So in those two patients, we actually would prefer the rhythm control option. So let's first look at the rate control options that are, that are available for our patients. Again, we have a table summarizing the main drugs we use. One of the most effective drugs is the non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, diltiazem. It's very useful because it can be given in multiple ways. One is an IV push, an IV drip, a PO short-acting medication, and a PO long-acting version the extended release formulation. These are the doses. Uh, it's a very, very effective rate control medication, but it does have negative inotropic effects on the heart it, uh, as a result of it being a non-dihydropyridine non calcium channel blocker. It's still okay to use a temporary dose such as a single IV push in patients, even if they have chronic heart failure without too much worry. Uh, remember that controlling the rhythm in heart, uh, controlling their heart rate in heart failure will actually improve their symptoms. Then there are the beta blockers. Uh, a good option is metoprolol, which is a beta-1 selective agent. This can be given either as an IV push or um, as a PO medication, although it's sometimes given as an IV drip as well. This is a preferred long-term medication in heart failure because it not only helps with cardiac remodeling, but it can also help control the heart rate. It's also useful for atrial fibrillation that you suspect might be due to a hyperadrenergic state, such as hyperthyroidism. Esmolol is a very short-acting beta-1 selective uh, beta blocker, which is uh, available only as an IV drip. Uh, 
Um, this, these are, this is how it's dosed. And it's useful for acute stabilization in inpatients, especially in ICU patients where you might be concerned about using a long, longer acting beta blocker, such as metoprolol. Digoxin is a sodium potassium pump blocker that also has a powerful secondary effect on blocking the AV node. It can be given as an IV or PO uh, medication, first with a loading dose followed by a maintenance dose. It tends not to be very effective at, when used as a first line single agent, but it can be very useful when used and as an adjunct agent to one of the previous three um, options if they're not controlling the rhythm, uh, rate by themselves. Note that use of digoxin, especially in patients with renal failure, is associated with not only uh, visual side effects, but also significant arrhythmias. Uh, some of the classic arrhythmias specifically associated with digoxin are atrial tachycardia with AV block, a regularized atrial fibrillation, which is when atrial fibrillation is associated with uh, such a severe AV block that none of the atrial fibrillation beats are conducted through the ventricles, and there's a regular junctional escape rhythm with a slow heart rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. And finally, bidirectional VT, where the um, axis of the uh, ventricular tachycardia changes from beat to beat. Finally, a second or thir third line rate control agent is amiodarone. This is generally considered as an antiarrhythmic. It's a class three antiarrhythmic, but in patients with severe LV dysfunction and who are hemodynamically tenuous, perhaps on pressors, and where beta blockers and calcium channel blockers aren't really good options, uh, this can be used as an alternative for rate control. Few pointers about rate control. Uh, generally, rate controlling the patient to less than 110 beats per minute rather than a more conservative target of, say, 90 beats per minute is enough uh, as long as the patient remains asymptomatic and the LV function is good. So this is was studied specifically in the RACE2 trial published in the New England Journal in 2010. They compared uh, targeting a heart rate of less than 110 to a heart rate less than 190, and they found that there was really no difference in outcomes. AV blockers should be avoided in any patient with atrial fibrillation with WPW or pre-excitation. In those patients, choose the rhythm control agent procainamide instead. And never use uh, medications in patients who, who are very unstable, who are hypotensive, altered, um, and in those patients, go straight to electrical cardioversion. This is an example of atrial fibrillation in a patient with WPW. Again, you see a wide complex rhythm with ir an irregular, irregular tachycardia. Uh, the wide complex may make you initially suspicious of ventricular tachycardia, but uh, in a patient with any known history of WPW, the preferred option is procainamide. And of beta blockers and uh, diltiazem are absolutely contraindicated in this patient. Moving on to rhythm control strategies. Uh, options would include electrical cardioversion, chemical cardioversion, and ablation. So whenever the duration of the atrial fibrillation is more than 48 hours, or you're not sure for how long the patient has had the atrial fibrillation, you should always initiate anticoagulation for three weeks prior to the cardioversion or otherwise perform a transesophageal echo to rule out an intraatrial thrombus. Unless they're hemodynamically unstable, in which case uh, it's better to just go ahead and cardiovert them rather than run the risk of them decompensating further. Anticoagulation should also be continued for four weeks after you cardiovert the patient as a result of um, muscle stasis, as a result of the sh uh, shock that you delivered. You'll cause a temporary state of myocardial stunning, which will increase the risk of stroke as well. So when you electrically cardiovert the patient, you perform a synchronized cardioversion uh, with between 120 joules biphasic energy or uh, 200 to 360 joules monophasic. 
Some of the drugs that you can use for rhythm control would include, again, amiodarone. And when you're looking to rhythm control a patient, amiodarone is, an actual, is actually a first-line agent rather than a, a second or third-line agent for rate control. You'd load them with a loading dose, uh, keeping in mind that amiodarone stays in the body for a very, very long period of time. It has a very long half-life. And uh, once you give them a loading dose, you just need a low-maintenance dose to maintain their rhythm. It's a very good option because although it does have serious side effects, including uh, thyroid disorders and uh, pulmonary fibrosis in the lung, it is okay in multiple disease states, such as heart failure, LVH, and CAD. And it's also one of the least likely of all the antiarrhythmic therapies to cause an arrhythmia itself. Dofetilide is another class three antiarrhythmic that is okay in patients with heart failure and CAD, but contraindicated with patients who have QT prolongation and renal failure because it does increase the risk of developing torsades. Dronetarone is a class three antiarrhythmic um, potassium channel blocker. Flecainide and propafenone are class one C antiarrhythmics. They're sodium channel blockers. They're used mainly in patients with healthy hearts so patients who don't have any history of ischemic heart disease, LVH, um, or heart failure, they can be used in two ways, either as just maintenance rate rhythm control therapy in those patients with healthy hearts, or it can be used as part of what's called a pill-in-the-pocket approach, where a patient is uh, carries these medications in their pocket, and whenever they feel symptoms like palpitations, they can take one of these and um, hopefully it will cardiovert them chemically and the symptoms should resolve. Sotolol, another class three antiarrhythmic, um, okay in patients with CAD, as it has some beta blocking effects as well, which would be helpful for the CAD. And procainamide, a class 1A antiarrhythmic, which as we discussed before, is the preferred agent for atrial fibrillation related to Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So to summarize, uh, patients with healthy hearts, you can choose flecainide or perfafenone either as a maintenance rhythm control uh, approach or as a part of a pill-in-the-pocket strategy taken PRN for patients who develop symptoms as outpatients. Usually this is given in combination with a rate control agent. In patients with severe heart failure, you can choose amiodarone or defetilide. In patients with a CAD history, you can choose dofetilide or sotolol and amiodarone if it's refractory. And in patients with WPW, choose procainamide for cardioversion. For a more long-term solution to rhythm control, uh, you can choose an approach called a catheter ablation. This is where an electrophysiologist will perform an EP study to map out the origin of the atrial fibrillation as we saw in the early part of the lecture, and then destroy the foci of AFib that they identified in the study using either a cold cryoablation or radiofrequency ablation. The Castle AF trial, a landmark trial published in the New England Journal in 2018, showed that in patients with symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, catheter ablation did much, much better than medical therapy in terms of reducing patient's mortality. Later, they tried to repeat a similar study in all patients, not just with those with heart failure. That was the Cabana trial published in JAMA in 2019. Um, in that case, they actually didn't find that ablation did better for mortality, but it could be useful in reducing hospitalizations and recurrence of atrial fibrillation in those patients. So ablation is generally performed if uh, you want a rhythm control strategy, but either electrical or chemical cardioversion is not possible or preferable. Here's a diagram showing how the catheter ablation approach works. So a catheter is placed through the IVC, enters the right atrium, and then via transeptal puncture, it enters the left atrium and 
the electrophysiologist will investigate the area around the pulmonary veins to look for any foci of atrial fibrillation. Once they've identified them, they can use a cold cryoballoon to ablate the area around the uh, identified focus of atrial fibrillation, or they can direct a radiofrequency catheter to uh, essentially burn away the foci of atrial fibrillation. Another option, which can be used in patients who are already being planned for open heart surgery for a different reason, that's called a maze procedure. Uh, this is where a surgeon would burn a maze-like pattern directly into the atrial tissue, which would theoretically disrupt the abnormal atrial circuits and isolate the likely foci of atrial fibrillation. So here's a set of diagrams showing the maze patterns that can be cut into the left atrium. See that the pulmonary vein or veins are being isolated here and here. They're being isolated multiple times in this procedure, and again, isolated here. Many times they also cut into the right atrium as well, since that can be on an alternative focus of fibrillation. Finally, for those patients who you can't rate control despite trying them on multiple different agents, uh, and you're not able to take them for a rhythm um, they're not successful at getting their rhythm catheter ablated or with the maze procedure. A last resort option would be to completely ablate their AV node and place a dual chamber pacemaker. So in this procedure, an electrophysiologist would go in and burn away the AV node, completely destroying the connection between the atria and ventricles, creating an iatrogenic third degree heart block. In this way, the fibrillation waves would continue in the atrium, but none of them could be conducted through the truth of the ventricles, so it wouldn't affect um, the ventricular rate at all. Because there's no uh, connection between the sinus node and the ventricles anymore, you would have to insert a pacemaker into the heart in order to appropriately pace the ventricles um, and maintain a normal heart rhythm. Another situation where this can be really useful is in those patients with tachybrady syndrome, where AFib with RVR alternates with a significant sinus bradycardia. In these patients, you really don't want to use a, re a regular rate control approach because giving them beta blockers or calcium channel blockers while they're in a sinus bradycardia would slow down their heart rate inappropriately and cause uh, severe symptoms such as hypotension or syncope. And so the best option in this case is to uh, destroy their AV node and put in a pacemaker, at which point you can give them high-dose beta blockers to suppress their atrial fibrillation uh, rate when they're in RVR uh, without worrying that you're going to cause severe bradycardia when they're not in atrial fibrillation. Here's a diagram of how that works. There is an implanted subcutaneous pacemaker device placed under the skin with two leads, one going into the right atrium, and one going into the right ventricle. The purpose of this right atrial lead is to sense the patient's native heart rhythm when they're in sinus rhythm and allow synchronous activity between the atrial and ventricles. When this lead detects that the patient is in atrial fibrillation, it won't um, sense those beats and inappropriately conduct them to the ventricles. In theory, that's how it should work, at least. So that's all for my lecture on atrial fibrillation. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great day.